to open call. Uh, how many of you have read this book, Longitude? Oh my goodness. you got to read this book. This is a great book. It's not that long either. It's a great story. So um, this is one of the first open calls. So the uh, British government in the... I assumed you had all read it. I wasn't going to have to summarize it. Uh, it was around the 1700s or 1600s. It was a long time ago. Like late 1600s. Late 1600s. There we go. You've read it. No, you've heard about it. I know about it. Yeah. All right. Uh, so they had this big challenge of figuring out the longitude of a ship at sea. So now, obviously, we have GPS, and you're out on a boat, and you know right where you are. Back then, people would go out on a boat, and they didn't know where they were. I mean, it's like really bad actually. People were dying and getting lost and so they needed to, and apparently it's relatively easy to figure out the latitude of a ship at sea from because of the sun, uh, but it's not easy to figure out the longitude. Obviously you need both pieces of information. So the British government tried to solve this problem and failed and then they said, all right, we'll give a prize to anyone who can figure out how to solve this problem. And Many of the uh, most famous scientists at the time, Isaac Newton worked on this problem, for example, a lot of very famous astronomers, Edmund Halley, and all of them thought that the solution would be some kind of astronomical solution. Uh, and so they worked on this for a long time and failed. Over and over and over again, they failed. Uh, and in the end, the, the person that solved this problem was a clockmaker from a rural area. And his solution was uh, not an astronomical solution, but to have a timepiece that keeps accurate time. And somehow, if you can keep accurate time while you're on a boat, that can tell you, where you what your longitude is. And to understand that, you have to read the book. Uh, but so the thing I love about this story is that you know they, the first reaction of many people to try to solve a problem is to look to one community of experts, people like Isaac Newton, who are, have clearly demonstrated they're good at some things, uh, but the best solution to a specific problem might be with someone else. And it's often very hard to know who that other person might be. So what if we had a way where everyone could contribute and we could find these novel and unexpected solutions? So in this way, it's very much like the wiki surveys that we talked about yesterday, wanting to be open to new ideas from unexpected sources. Um, the challenge is that you, if you just say, like, I'm going to open up and I'm going to, like, ask everyone to just send me their solutions, you're going to run into a problem if the solutions are very difficult to check. Because then you're going to be flooded with things and you're not going to be able to read them all. Um, so what you need are certain problems where the solutions are easy to check. That is the trick that allows you to be open to lots of things. So, do you mean... So does this mean solutions are easier to generate than to check? So no, check. They have to be easy to check. So let me well, give this you. This is not the statement of the problem. This is the. This is the. This is the. How to solve the problem? You have to find a way of asking your question such that it's easy to check the solution. So most of our social science is not like this. So usually it's like we want to understand inequality or whatever we want to do, and you get a, people send you papers and like, is this? You have to read them carefully and check that, and like takes a lot of time. So because it's so expensive and costly to evaluate a solution, we have to be restricted in the kinds of solutions we look at. But imagine if that process could somehow be easy or even automated. So for example, I don't know if you get these emails now, but you will soon. Like people email you and they're like, I have this um, new theory of society that combines quantum physics and Darwinian evolution. I think this is going to totally change the way we view the world and it's going to create world peace. And you're like, wow. All right. That, <laughs> and then you're like, uh, that could be cool, but I don't really have time to read this unsolicited manu manifesto. Um, so imagine if you could say to that person, Okay, that sounds great. Here is a task that I want you to do. If you can use your fantastic ideas to do this task, then you'll upload your solution to the task to a website that will automatically check it. And then if you 
pass those checks, then I will absolutely promise to read your manuscript. So I would guess that a lot of these people would not be able to solve that problem. But if they could, wouldn't you want to know? I mean, that's the thing. Like, I think we have to realize that is, you know, there, it's a big world out there, right? And a lot of people have a lot of good ideas. And I think if you look at the open source software community, you can see this kind of lots of contributions come from not the usual suspects. Um, so the key, though, is you have to have solutions that are easy to check. So <laughs> this is <laughs> uh, like I think part of the reason, one of the things that makes social science complicated is that the solutions are not easy to check. And so then I think charisma can play a big role in what happens. Like, was that idea interesting? Right? That is not the same as like, did that actually solve the problem? That's like interestingness, which is also cool. I love interesting talks too, but that plays a big role on charisma. And what I've seen some in computer science actually is really interesting, where for certain <laughs> kinds of prediction tasks, it's charisma free, some of it. Right? So it's like, here is the problem. Everyone has been working on this problem. Their error rate is this. My error rate is this. Like, you don't need to have charisma. If your error rate is better and it's faster or uses less memory or whatever, that's really cool. So again, it allows different kinds of people to contribute, not just people who are really charismatic. And then the last thing is, this approach can potentially lead to something where we have demonstrable progress. So think about how many social scientists are working very hard right now. And they have been working very hard for a very long time. Are we making progress? I actually think we are making progress, but now how would we explain that to like a member of Congress? Like, look how many papers we publish in <laughs> American Sociological Review. That's, look at that progress. Look how many papers. We published so many more papers than we did 10 years ago. So we must be making progress. Um, so imagine though if there were clear tasks that we were trying to solve and we could show we're getting better and better at solving them. Right? That would be pretty cool. So, so like, is this is this really possible? So I think this is really possible, and I think we're going to participate in it in about uh, 45 minutes. So we're going to get demonstrable progress, we're going to get openness to new ideas, and we're going to get that all applied to a problem of societal importance. Yeah? Well, okay, let's go. Yeah? Yeah. Are you worried about this approach being sort of overgeneralized? Like in the sense that if, if this this way of defining tasks and way of defining a research agenda yeah. become, in a very explicit way um, works for some cases yeah. uh, that, that then could become the expect that, that could become the expectation for kind of all social science research um, with the result that the set of problems or questions that are possible to tackle in social science research gets narrowed. Yes. So if you have a problem that's uh, less well defined, you can't get uh, funding from Congress to work on it yep. because you can't define these metrics. So I understand that concern and I'm not at all worried about that because I've seen how hard it is to even get one of these to happen. <laughs> like I think we are a long way from this style of thing taking over social science. A long way. Um, and I also think that there are lots of parts of social science that if we thought about in this way might be amenable to this approach. It, it's not really as foreign as it may seem, I hope. Uh, I should also say that this is not something that social, you know, is without precedent in the academic community. These kinds of, this is sometimes called, one version of the, the open call is called the common task method. And these are very common in machine translation and in a lot of parts of machine learning and computer science. So it's not like this is a, this way of organizing research has been successful in other parts of the research community. Uh, those 
hearts tend to be focused on more predictive accuracy. Social science tends not to be focused on predictive accuracy. But I think increasingly we will see social scientists getting interested in predictive accuracy, as I'll talk more about when I talk about the challenge. Um, like, there's, it's kind of strange that like, you just, social scientists don't really care about it that much. To me, it just seems like a big part of the world and how you think about what science is that we're kind of ignoring. Yep. So, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. I got, forgot the order. Yep. Okay. So I had a, I had a question that I think I've answered, but I figured I'd share it. Good. Um, which is sort of related to what Connor was asking. Um, uh, does doing these kinds of open calls sort of uh, become greedy about the sort of level of human intelligence that you're directing towards a single research question or a single problem and how do we need to regulate like self-regulate the kinds of research questions we put out there um, that deserve this kind of attention but then I thought well actually like your research question will be evaluated by the number of people that decide to work on something and so in some ways it's like a good test for our research questions to say like <coughs> will it stand up to this kind of open call and will people be interested in working on these problems because they also think they're important. And so the best research questions will get the best work. Yeah, I think that's a great way of thinking about it. Okay. So is it actually the best research questions or is it about the charismatic leaders? So let's say that there <laughs> would be this kind of family related challenge where there's Matt, <coughs> named person who's leading it yeah. and then he's really prominent and then everyone starts to work at that, on that and creates the process, process. So what, how do you choose the challenges? Where should yeah. they come from? So, ideally, so I've thought a lot more about this now. So the Fragile Families Challenge, we just kind of picked it. <laughs> uh, now that it's running, I think a better way to do it next time, but it wouldn't have been possible the first time, is to have it come out of some well-established community. So in fact, there is already a community of researchers using the Fragile Families data. There's a big community of researchers. So imagine those people get in a room and decide, and then that common task emerges out of that community. So I, that, in my view, would be the best way. For this particular problem, if we had brought them into a room and said, this is what we're going to do, they would have, it would have been very hard to get that off the ground. So for this one, we had to pick it ourselves, but it's kind of a top-down model. But ideally, it would be a kind of bottom-up model and then the community as a whole agrees, and then people who make contributions will be acknowledged by that community. Yeah. So if I can just continue. So in computer science, there was this call for pervasive computing at some point of time, and it really directed all of the research to particular problems like context detection and stuff like that. And no one cares of that anymore. Yeah. Because that wasn't the relevant question, because yeah. the whole concept was wrong, actually, yeah. in the end. It was right and wrong at the same time. Yeah, no, so it's true that like sometimes we make mistakes. And I mean, then we should move on, right? So <laughs> that I think that it's true that also, though, by directing lots of resources at something quickly, you can figure out if it's a mistake much faster. Otherwise, people would have been potentially doing that for a long, long time. So I think we should not expect that all open calls will yield useful results. And some of them might be focused on the wrong problem. But that's the same with any kind of research. Yeah? Yeah. So I think this is really amenable to social work in particular because we're 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 looking for we care about the margins and we're looking for solutions to specific concrete things, mm -hmm. right? So developing affordable housing or mm -hmm. what have you. I guess the the problem I'm having trouble with is thinking about how to include the voices of the people who are directly affected. Mm -hmm. Um and so I could envision a situation where you can, you know, do a series of focus groups, for example, which are timely and costly, but nonetheless give you insight into mm -hmm. the specific community. Mm -hmm. But how could you, how would you think about doing that in, in this kind of situation? And even, I think, for like international examples, like folks who maybe don't have access to computers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I think it's a, it's a great point. And I think, so there's like a justice question. And I think there's also a... Um, it will likely be more successful if it has participation from the people who are most likely to be affected. So it's not, it's, it, part of it is access and part of it is actually quality. Like it's going to be better if it has more 
uh, diverse participants. So I think that's a challenge. I think there are, that's something with the Fragile Families Challenge we've thought a lot about, about how to get a diverse group of participants. We've certainly not been perfect. There's a lot of barriers to entry to this particular uh, challenge that we're doing. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind um, that you want the people who know the most about the task, but you also want some people who potentially will think about it very differently. Yeah. So I have a question about like what is demonstrable progress? Mean? Yeah. So I was thinking like the Human Genome Project, yep. right? Like thirty years plus, like I don't know how many billions of yeah. dollars. Like there's no cure for cancer or anything yeah. like that. So what, what what would social science need? Like I just look at this Yogi Berra quote. Like I'm I'm very uh, skeptical of direction this sense. He says like you've got to be very careful if you don't know where you're going because you might not get there. Yes. Um, that is I just kinda, like, that's kind of the human genome project to me. Like we just what are we exactly doing here? So I guess it's so some of these questions uh, a lot of them are about like sort of as if this is already like succeeded and is gonna like take over social science. Which I think we're so far from this concern. I, I guess what I would say, so this is a legitimate concern if there were lots of these things going on. But right now there are basically none of them going on, close to zero. And I think that we haven't even really, as a community, explored this option. So it might be that if we start thinking about this, if more people start doing these, <clears throat> we might run into these problems. For sure. But also, I think if more people start doing them, we might figure out ways of addressing them. Like, how should these challenges be posed? What does progress mean? I mean, so in the Fragile Families Challenge, it means a very narrow thing, uh, which is not like progress in terms of improving the lives of disadvantaged kids, which is the thing we care about, or progress in advancing scientific understanding, which is also a thing we care about. It's really like the ability to predict held out data. So you could say, well, you could be making progress on that, but that's not the right metric. I think that's a very reasonable concern. I don't have an answer beyond that. Yeah? So I have a question very related to that. So if in this uh, exercise, the metric of progress is the ability to predict held out data, presumably a lot of the successful models will use some kind of machine learning technique or something like that. that seems to me to render the causal process sort of opaque. And for social science, one of obviously one of the central interests is in prediction in order to improve the ability to make interventions or whatever else. But another yeah. very important goal is to learn generalizable truths about the causal processes leading either to delinquency or poverty or something yeah. like that. And so as soon as you put a machine learning, you've stuck machine learning on it, how do you, how do you draw any of those broader general inferences? That is a great question. I will just say two, I will say three things. First, it turns out machine learning models don't seem to be working better in this case for reasons I can explain. Uh, and second is, I'll talk much more about that when I talk about the challenge. That is an important concern because it seems to be <coughs> asking a question in a way that we're not asking, but I think we have a way of making progress on that exact question. Yeah? This is more like a comment, but yeah. I think that there are there are some social scientists that are already sort of very interested in, in questions of, sort of prediction and forecasting, and of course demography is one of them. But there's one problem there, which is that a lot of demographers are criticized for their obsession with uh, you know, forecasting. Yeah. It's seen as the market of our tool. Uh, and I, you know, so I think that there are, so to think that this is a, only a computer science paradigm yeah. is, I mean, I think we need to draw from within and say that there are already disciplines within the social sciences that are really interested in it and, and are trying to find ways to, to, you know, borrow thinking across disciplines. Um, so I don't think we have to look very far. That is true. So demographers are definitely, uh, they do do these kinds of forecasts. Yeah. Um, and also verify them, right? Like yes. These error approaches. And yes. I think it's funny that they're criticized for doing something that's marketable. Yeah. <laughs> like a, really only in this certain community would that be a bad thing, doing something <laughs> useful. I mean, I was trying to teach population projections and there was a conflict in the department because they said, I don't want to teach projections. This is like a, it's like, it's, 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 it
I was like, is this a reason not to eat something? But, but it's, these are discussions that people have. They are discussions, <laughs> and we shouldn't ignore them. But I think that, um, I mean, my personal speculation, this is now we're into speculation land, there is so much interest now in machine learning and like if you look at what's happening inside of industry lot it's becoming exciting this idea of predicting things from data is now becoming kind of exciting and sexy in society and all of these demographers live in society they do not i mean as much as they are a small community they also like read the the new york times and they see this stuff happening and they see billions of dollars being allocated to this stuff and so <coughs> Part of it is I think they'll naturally become more curious about it. Uh, and then also, as more and more gets invested in improving humanity's ability to do certain things, I think it would behoove us to sort of take advantage of some of that investment. I mean, we don't have to. We can sit, keep doing what we're doing. But it seems like an opportunity to take advantage of uh, all this energy going into this other thing. Now, I will say one of the things I've learned from the challenge is that that is not the best way to think about it because a lot of the stuff that they are doing at Google Google and Facebook and Amazon does not directly port over to social science data, and that is an experience that you will have in 30 minutes. Yeah? Um, yeah, no, going off of what Adana said, I think it's a really good point because, like, I got kind of sick of situations where people would say, oh, there's a social science data set We'll put the dependent variable over here, we'll put the independent variable over here, and then we'll machine learn. And then that will, you know, and so I think that, like, what's promising to me is that in social science, uh, there are approaches which view machine learning as sort of like one of the black box tools that can be used mm -hmm. and not, so like, um, some of what Brandon Stewart is doing mm -hmm. is all along those lines. There's a guy at MIT, or, yeah, MIT, uh, Victor Chernosukov, mm -hmm. who has this thing called, like, double machine learning which is a really fancy name for just like doing regressions with machine learning. <laughs> like yeah. Attention please, this is a test of a Princeton University emergency <laughs> okay, yes. system. This is oh yeah, test. promising. <laughs> yes. Promising answers to Adonis question. Okay, yeah, so I think that's great and I think we'll show that this is not just regular machine learning. Um, let's take a break. <laughs> and we'll move on to the next chunk after the break. It was a hot take. <laughs>